This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Now, this is a first for this show. I never expected to be going down this particular path. But my topic today is probably one that everybody out there is going to have an interest in. My guest, Bruce Grayson, is Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. UVA, as it's commonly known, about 90 minutes away from where I grew up one of the public Ivies. So Bruce definitely brings his credentials, his scientific chops, and an association with a quite well-known, well-respected academic institution. Where are we going today? Near-death experiences. But what can we learn about near-death experiences right now? I mean, we know very little. We know very little about the conscious and unconscious mind. And I think what's so cool about Bruce is he really did not have any kind of religious belief system. He strictly started to look at these near-death experiences, all of this data that he was gathering, and said, what is going on here? Now, we surely don't know what is going on, but you will see with Bruce, a man who has dedicated his life to studying near-death experiences, there might be something here that causes us all to pause. Now, for me, my pause might just be, damn it, we're all living in a simulation. But who the hell knows? Without any further delay, let's jump right in with Bruce Grayson and talk about what comes after. Going through your world, I think one of the optimum places to start is to bring people into an understanding. I was writing this down. It's like, okay, if I was to read your current position, Professor Emeritus, Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at UVA, University of Virginia. I went to George Mason right down the street. This is a pretty big title. I mean, this covers a lot. So we're about to go into a topic area that is just a wow. So why don't you take me back in time? I saw one video with you and it was just great how you introduced it. A young lady named Holly. And I would love for you to tell that story because my audience doesn't know that story. It's a great story because it brings us into your world. It does, Mike. Let me give you a little background. I was raised in a scientific household where there was never any talk about anything non-physical, anything spiritual or religious. It just never occurred to us to talk about those things. As far as we knew, the physical world was all there was. So I went through college and medical school with this purely materialistic mindset. What you see is what you get, and there's nothing else. When you die, that's just the end. And that was fine with me. And then after I finished my medical school, just a few months into my psychiatric training, I was called to the emergency room to see a patient who had overdosed. She was totally unconscious. She was out cold. I tried to talk with her. I tried to move her limbs, and she didn't respond at all. But her roommate was waiting for me in another room down the hall. So I talked to the roommate about what had been going on in the patient's life, what stresses she had, what she might have taken. And then when I finished, I went back to the patient, and she was still out cold. So she was being admitted to the intensive care unit. Bruce, when you say out cold, what do you mean for those people out there that have a medical or a science background? When you say out cold, what do you mean exactly? Well, we weren't doing any physiological measures of her brainwaves. We don't know how unconscious she was, but she was not responding to either verbal or tactile stimuli. I would move her limbs around and call her name and pinch her, and she didn't respond at all. She seemed to be in a very deep state of either sleep or chemical unconsciousness from what she had taken but she was not arousable at all. When I went to see her the next morning, she was awake, but quite drowsy still. Went to her room in the intensive care unit. I introduced myself. She said with her eyes still closed in a groggy voice, I know who you are. I remember you from last night. And that kind of startled me because I assumed she didn't know I was there the night before. 
I said, when I came to see you, I thought you were unconscious. She said, not in my room. I saw you talking to my roommate. Well, that kind of threw me because I couldn't imagine how that could be. Giving her the benefit of the doubt, I said to her, you mean the nurses told you I talked to your roommate? And then she opened her eyes and looked at me in the face and said, no, I saw you. And then she went on to tell me about the conversation I had with her roommate, what we were wearing, where we were sitting, what we were doing, without making any mistakes. That just blew me away. I couldn't understand how that could happen. The only way she could possibly know that is if she had left her body and come to join me in the other room. And that just didn't make sense to me. As far as I could tell, I was my body. The idea of leaving your body totally was illogical. I didn't know what to do with that. I was really shaken up. It was frankly scary. How old were you again, probably? I was about 30. A very green intern in my first few months of post-medical school. But I mean, a hardcore scientific method guy. Yes, yes, yes. And this totally didn't make sense. And yet I was there to do a job to help her with her confusion. I didn't have time to deal with my confusion. I just kind of tried to push it out of the way and help her with her suicidal thinking. And a few days later, reflecting on this, I just couldn't make sense of it. And I tried to tell myself it's some kind of a trick they're playing on me. I couldn't imagine how, but I just couldn't deal with it at that time. It just didn't make sense at all. And it wasn't until several years later that Raymond Moody wrote his book, Life After Life, which gave us the term near-death experiences and described what they were like. Moody was working with me at that point. I read his book and talked with him and realized for the first time that this experience I had with this one patient was not one isolated incident, but it's part of a huge phenomenon that was quite common. I still couldn't understand it, which to me as a skeptical scientist meant, you need to understand this. You need to move toward it, not away from it. So I tried to understand it. And here I am 50 years later, still trying to understand it. There's a lot of thoughts that go through my head and just to touch with some issues out there. Recently, I have paid attention and these are just kind of random thoughts, but they kind of go into the issue of how much we don't know about the mind and frankly, the brain. One of them, for example, are some of these people that have the memory that allows them to remember every day of their life. One of the actresses that used to be on the old taxi show has that ability. Another issue that I think is really interesting for me too, for example, when you look at octopus, octopus, their tentacles and whatnot also have elements of thinking or whatnot. And a third thought I would throw out there, I had actually George Mason, economist on this show, a guy quite well known, a guy named Robin Hansen. He wrote a book and he was talking about that when we get to that point where there's going to be AI, the fastest way we might get there is when they can take what is the mind, when they figure out where the mind is. And if we could ever port the mind to a drive, then we could kind of so-called live forever. The fourth point I want to add, just as we get into this playground of here, is, gosh, what you described is almost like, and I like it, is like one of my guilty pleasure movies. It's almost Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, isn't it? And Ghost? Well, I guess in some ways it is. There's a person that's kind of an in-between state, whatnot. But listen, before we go off on too much of a tangent, I'm just throwing some ideas <laughs> out there. It really gets to the idea of how complicated, and we could go on this forever. You've spent your whole career on this. But give me another example. There's another guy, and just to let people know, so let's just get some other examples on. There was a guy named Al Sullivan that I saw you tell this story. I thought that was an amazing story. Why don't you tell the Al Sullivan story so we can start to build here? Yeah, that was even more impressive to me. I mean, the first one with that patient, Holly, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I didn't know to ask her about other things that might have been happening as part of that experience. She was lost to follow up very soon. So I really didn't have a lot of information about that. And it was easy for me in retrospect to say, I'm misremembering it or it didn't really happen or something like that. But Al Sullivan was quite a different issue. This was about 25 or 30 years later when I knew a fair amount about near-death experiences. And I met Al. He came to a support group we had for near-death experiencers. And he was a 55-year-old man who was a truck driver. He said that he had had a crushing chest pain and as a result of that was taken to the hospital and had emergency quadruple bypass surgery, replacing four vessels around his heart that had shut down. During that operation, he said, he left his body, watched from above as the doctors were operating on him. And he said... He was stunned to see his surgeon flapping his arms as if he was trying to fly. And he kind of demonstrated that by wiggling his elbows. 
that didn't make sense to me. I'd been a doctor for about 30 years at that point. I'd never seen or heard of anything like that. You don't see doctors on TV shows flapping their arms like that in the middle of an operation. So I assumed that this was some sort of hallucination, maybe due to the anesthesia he'd been given. But he insisted that this was real. And he mentioned a few technical details that he had seen that could be corroborated. So with his permission, I talked to his surgeon. And his surgeon, to my surprise, corroborated everything that Al had said. He said that he had developed this idiosyncratic habit. He would get gowned and gloved in this sterile gown. And then while his assistants were starting the operation, and then he would go into the operating room and watch them for a while and supervise them. And he didn't want to touch anything that might not be sterile. So he placed his palms where he knew they wouldn't touch anything flat against his chest and then pointed things out to his assistants by using his elbows rather than his fingers so he wouldn't touch anything. And he demonstrated it looked just like Al was saying. It looked like he was wiggling his elbows like as if he was trying to fly. Quite startling to me, this was something that the patient should not have been able to see. His eyes, of course, were taped shut for the operation so they wouldn't dry out. And yet he saw this. And it's not something that he could have guessed. It's not something that you would think a doctor would be doing. And yet it was completely accurate. When I saw you tell those two stories, it just causes any curious person to stop. I have to say, I did not actually have any kind of negative feeling. My first thought was, wow, okay, if Bruce is telling me these two stories, more than likely, given his background, he's got thousands of these stories. That was my first thought. I was like, and if he's got thousands of these stories, then, I mean, I guess we've all got busy lives and whatnot, but the fact that we don't know more about this or that we don't hear about this on a regular basis is an interesting thought to me too. It is. And not all of them are corroboratable. Sometimes people report things that would be expected to guess or that no one else can confirm for them. Professor Jan Holden at the University of North Texas actually studied about 100 of these cases, and she found that 92% of them were completely accurate as corroborated by other people in the room. It's not just a lucky guess. These are things that are really happening. Do you have educated guesses as to what is happening when this is happening? Whatever is happening, when you've got the corroboration, what can you even theorize? That our understanding of how the brain and the mind work together, this is just, we just have no clue. That's right. We don't have any clue. It's hard to imagine how you can have consciousness seeing things, perceiving things, thinking, forming memories when you're not in your body. Consciousness outside the body, we have no mechanism for that. However, the dirty secret of neuroscience is that we also have no mechanism for consciousness inside the body. No one has ever come up with a hint of a suggestion of an idea of how electrical and physical signals in the brain can create a thought or a feeling. We assume that the brain creates the mind but we don't have any idea how. So I'm not sure that consciousness outside the brain is any more mysterious than consciousness inside the brain. When you throw this out on the table, it just takes everything that we kind of think we know. I guess for me, I start to imagine, okay, there's some type of potential energy that allows us to exist outside of ourselves. I don't have any explanation. You don't obviously either. I mean, you've been studying it forever. I mean, it's just kind of leaves your mouth open, doesn't it? You just don't know what to say almost. It does contradict what we think of as common sense. In everyday life, it seems as if the mind is what the brain does. When you get intoxicated, that affects your thinking. When you get hit on the head or have a stroke, you don't think very well. So it seems as if the brain creates the mind in normal everyday life. But in exceptional cases like near-death experiences, and there are many others I could mention, it seems like the connection between mind and brain separate. And this is not a new idea by any means. 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates wrote that the brain is the messenger or the interpreter of the mind. And this has been a minority opinion throughout history among neuroscientists. People have talked about the brain being a receiver for thoughts or a filter for thoughts. This is not all that surprising when you think about how the brain evolved as a device to control us and help us negotiate in the physical world. All our senses filter the input that comes in. There is a lot of light that's in the electromagnetic spectrum that we don't perceive. 
because it's not relevant to our survival in the physical world. So we see just a small portion of the total electromagnetic spectrum that's coming into our eyes all the time. And similarly, our ears only hear certain sound frequencies, the ones that are important to our survival. If there is a mind out there and a whole panoply of consciousness, it makes sense that the brain would filter out and just let in those thoughts that are most relevant to our physical survival. Certainly things like talking to deceased loved ones or seeing a deity are not relevant to finding food and shelter and a mate in the physical world. The brain filters those out. And possibly under extreme circumstances, like when the brain gets shut down, that filtering mechanism stops and it lets all sorts of other things come in. As I said, this is not just unique to near-death experiences. There's something called terminal lucidity in which people who have had advanced dementia and have not been able to communicate or recognize family for months or years suddenly become completely lucid in the hours or sometimes days before they die. And of course, when family sees them becoming carrying on coherent conversations and recognizing them, they think, oh, great, he's recovering. But of course, the brain cannot recover from something like Alzheimer's disease. In fact, they do end up dying very shortly afterwards. And we have no medical explanation for how that could be. The brain cannot regenerate itself. Given your position, your status, your achievements, your being at UVA, and just to remind people, University of Virginia, basically a public ivy, this is one of the best schools in the world. People clearly know of you and your work. As far as I could tell in your work, you are putting these examples out there. You're putting this research out there, and you're, you're not saying you necessarily have any explanation, but you're saying, look, here are things that are happening. We can't ignore these things. We're scientists. These things are happening. Do you have critics that attempt to explain away some of the examples that you put out on the table, like you have so far in this conversation? Of course. I sympathize with that because I was raised with this materialistic mindset. And for many, many years, I tried to figure out what is going on in the brain to create or cause these experiences. I eventually came to the point where I decided that the materialistic models just are not cutting it, and there must be some plausible alternative. The most obvious alternative is that there is a brain, a mind that exists somewhere else outside the body. The brain kind of receives thoughts from it. Now, that raises all sorts of questions about what is this mind? Where is it? How does it communicate with the brain? And I have no answers for those. It, there are huge holes in that theory. But there are also huge holes in the theory that the brain creates the mind, and they're equally implausible. So I think we just don't have an explanation for this right now. I think that's what I like about what you're doing is you're basically saying, like, hold on, we're making a lot of assumptions about brain-mind already. And then here we've got all these other examples over here that you don't want to consider, but these things have happened. And then when you put it all on the table, then it does force us all to stop for a second, pause, and say, gosh, we don't know anything. Yeah. You asked about critics who try to find explanations for it. I do that myself because I want to find an explanation for this. The most obvious one is that a lack of oxygen to the brain is partially responsible for this because no matter how you come close to death, one of the last things that happens is that you stop getting blood going to the brain. We looked at that. And in fact, there have been studies done in the US and in the UK in which they actually measure the oxygen in people who are close to death. They find that people who report near-death experiences actually have better oxygenation than people who don't report NDEs. The idea that oxygen deprivation is causing this just doesn't fit the data. Similarly, people have thought that drugs given to people who are dying are causing these experiences. And again, we find that the more drugs people are given, the less likely they are to report NDEs. This happens with one hypothesis after another. We tried to gather data to collect them. The data do not pan out. Now, there are a number of hypotheses that we just can't test at this point. One of the most popular ones is that there are drugs produced in the brain at the point of crisis, like near death, that will cause us to hallucinate these experiences. The problem is that some of these hypotheses chemicals, like endorphins, are released in such small amounts and for such a small amount of time, and we don't even know where in the brain to look for it, that it's virtually impossible for us to test right now with our current technology whether they're true or not. I think one of the things, and I brought this up earlier with the lady that used to be on Taxi and a lot of other people with memory going back, it strikes me in a comparative way to your work because 
if these people, I mean, perhaps they have some type of a defect, but if they have a defect, what is that defect? It seems to be an interesting one that they can remember every day of their life and what was going on on that particular day. Sure speaks to me when I see that example and I see what you're talking about, where your research has gone, they seem to connect in a way where it's like, mm, we don't know what our full capacity is. That's right. I think you're right that it is a defect that allows them to do this because it's adaptive for us as animals to forget things that aren't currently relevant. If you try to remember where you parked your car, it doesn't help to remember every time you've ever parked the car in the past. You want to forget all those past times and just remember the most relevant. The fact that you can remember everything in your life is a problem for a lot of people if they, if they have that. So the question would be also for those particular people, when those memories first come in, if they have that, quote, defect, when those memories first come in, are they encoding them differently inside the mind? Or are we all taking all these memories in and they're all dormant somewhere and we don't have the ability to access them, but they're all there? Those are great questions and we just don't have answers to them. Not even a sniff of an answer on those kinds of no, things. No, no. That's going to keep people busy for a long time trying to figure these things out, right? (laughs) Yes, it is. It is. Is there even a pathway in terms of research? Because I'm sure you do this. You imagine what the research might look like a century from now. Where would we be a century from now? Will we be any closer? I certainly hope we are. Science progresses in a kind of a slow way. Each generation of scientists thinks they have the answer. And then the next generation looks back in amusement at what the previous generation thought. 100 years ago, we would have never have thought you could do functional imaging of the brain the way we do it now. And I'm sure that we can't imagine what's going to happen in 50 or 100 years in terms of our ability to investigate what's going on in the brain and the mind. It is progressing. As you said, we know we're still looking. Recently, I was part of a multinational group that looked at a comparison between accounts of near-death experiences and accounts of psychedelic drug trips. We used around 800 narratives from my collection of people describing their near-death experiences. And then we collected 15,000 examples of people reporting their psychedelic drug experiences with a variety of agents. We did statistical analyses of the words and the word usage to find which drugs produce experiences that were most like the near-death experience. And as it turned out, the one that came closest to the NDE was ketamine, a dissociative anesthetic. A second was DMT, dimethyltryptyline, and third was salvi or sage. We were hoping that this would give us some clues as to what neurochemical pathways in the brain might be related to experiences like near-death experiences. And as it turned out, these three drugs that were the most common work by very different pathways in the brain. Ketamine works on the NMDA receptor and, and glutamate. DMT works in the serotonin mechanisms. So it didn't really help us look at what's causing these experiences in the brain. Furthermore, these experiences are not exact duplicates of near-death experiences. They're rough approximations of them. So we're not sure whether we're really dealing with the same phenomenon or not. People who have had both psychedelic drug experiences and near-death experiences tell me that they are not the same thing. There are just so many words we have to describe these basically undescribable experiences. So we tend to use the same words. As an example, if you were to ask someone who's been in combat to describe what they saw and heard and felt in the middle of a battle, and then ask someone who was watching a war movie to describe what they saw and heard and felt watching the movie, they would use a lot of the same words, but nobody would think they were the same experience. And they say that drug experiences have the same relationship to NDEs. You describe them the same way, but they're not the same thing. One is a poor copy of the other. Are there other examples? We've gone down the Holly example and we've gone down Al's example. Is there another example or two that you think of that maybe you don't use a lot, but you've had so many examples in your career to just kind of bring people into another moment where people kind of go, well, that's unexplained. That's unusual. One of the common features of near-death experiences is what seems to be an encounter with deceased loved ones. Maybe a third of people who have near-death experiences will report seeing deceased entities, and they're often identified as deceased family members or friends. And it is fairly easy to dismiss those as just wishful thinking or expectation. If you think you're dying, of course, you want to be welcomed by people who have gone on before you, so you imagine them. 
But there are a number of cases in which people saw or claim to have seen deceased loved ones who were not known to be dead. That eliminates the idea of expectation. Now, let me give you an example of this. This was a 25-year-old technical writer who was hospitalized with severe pneumonia, and he kept having respiratory arrest episodes where he couldn't breathe. And in the hospital, he had one particular nurse named Anita who was working most closely with him, and they developed kind of a friendship over the days he was there. And at one point, she told him that she was going to be away for a long weekend. He bid her goodbye, and she left. And shortly after that, he had another respiratory arrest episode in which he had a near-death experience. He found himself in a pastoral setting, very calm and very peaceful. And then he saw this nurse, Anita, walking towards him. He was startled. And so he said, Anita, what are you doing here? And she said to him, this is where I am now, but you can't stay here. You need to go back. And I want you to tell my parents that I love them very much. And I'm sorry, I wrecked the red MGB. And then she turned and walked away. Not too long after that, he came, found himself back in his body, having been resuscitated with complete memory of this near-death experience. And he told the first nurse that he saw about it in a very excited manner. And she started to cry and left the room. Well, it turned out that this nurse, Anita, had taken the weekend off to celebrate her 21st birthday with her parents who had come in from the country. And they surprised her for her birthday with a red MGB, which she promptly jumped in, took off for a drive, went down the hill and lost control of the car and smashed into a telephone pole, dying instantly a few hours before this patient's near-death experience. Now, there's no way he could have known or expected that she had died. She was a healthy 21-year-old, and he certainly couldn't have known how she died, and yet he did. About a decade ago, I published a paper with dozens and dozens of cases just like this, some going back to the ancient world. Pliny the Elder in the first century documented a case like this, and we have lots of other cases from the 19th century and the 20th and today. We just have no explanation for how these people could have come up with this information that turned out to be accurate. The one video that I saw with you giving a presentation, I realized you were pretty emotional. I don't know how people felt just listening to that number three story there, but I felt a little emotional because you kind of realized where it was going once you started the story. And you're thinking, no way, this is like a movie script. How can this happen? This can't happen. But then again, it does. And look, I'm calling you from Saigon, Vietnam today. So I'm in a Buddhist country. And one of the things that most Buddhists like to talk about is karma. Coincidence, this kind of thing, it seems also related and connected in a way. And look, just to take it on another side tangent, look, 1999, the famous movie came out, The Matrix. If there was any plausible explanation for what you are putting on the table, the fact that we might all live in a simulation could be a, a pretty plausible example, a pretty plausible uh, explanation as well. That's an amazing story, though. I mean, Beyond your writings, is that the primary place if people are like really looking to dive in and just see more and more of those stories? I mean, it just stops you. Like, I mean, I've been doing this podcast for a long time. There's not too many times where someone tells a story like that. I can't remember any, honestly. When you hear these things, they just must cause you to also kind of go, oh, what just hit me? Everyone does. Everyone does. As striking as some of these stories have been about people seeing from an out-of-body perspective and seeing deceased loved ones. Those are interesting from abstract philosophical perspective. But for me as a psychiatrist, what's most emotional for me is how these experiences change people's lives. After a near-death experience, you mean? Yes, yes. A common feature of a near-death experience is a life review where you go through events of your entire life. People say they're my life flash before me and so forth. A lot of these people who have this life review describe it not only from their own perspective, but from this perspective of other people involved in their lives. They see and feel the effects of their actions on other people. Let me give you an example of this. Tom Sawyer had a near-death experience in his 30s when a truck he was working under fell down and crushed his chest. He had a very elaborate life review that included this empathic part of a feature of experiences from other people's lives. I actually relived being a 17-year-old hot rodder driving his truck down a street. A drunk man ran out in front of his truck and almost hit him. He stopped the truck, very angry, a hot-headed teenager, rolled down his window and started yelling at the man. 
Of course, the drunk man reached his hand in the window and slapped Tom across the face. That was enough for this hot-headed teenager, so he opened the door, came out, and started punching the drunk man many, many times and left him a bloody mess on the median strip. Tom told me that when he lived this in his life review, he felt the whole experience, not only from his perspective, but from the drunk man's as well. And he said that he looked at his own face from the drunk man's perspective, saw him turning red, getting angry, and then started feeling each one of the 32 blows of his fists on his face and on his chest. He felt his nose getting bloodied. He felt his teeth going through his lower lip. And he felt all the humiliation that this man was feeling. And Tom came away with this, realizing that we are not separate individuals. We're all part of the same thing. And people talk about looking at your hand and each finger looks like it's a separate entity until you look at the palm and you see they're all connected. And he said, that's what this lesson teaches you, that we are not separate individuals and that what you do to someone else, you're basically doing to yourself. One after another near-death experiencer tells me that they came back from their NDE realizing that we are not alone. We are not separate. We're all in this together. And that the way to live in this life is basically following the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbors as yourself. It's no coincidence that every religion we have has some form of the golden rule as its basic precept, because most of these religions came from mystical experiences like NDEs. It really causes you to just stop. What's the explanation? I keep having these big question marks kind of floating over my head. I just can't imagine after for as long as you've been involved with it. Let me take you a side direction here. I was thinking about time. When people go into or have a near-death experience, they are experiencing more time inside that near-death experience than the actual time in our current understanding of time outside of their near-death experiences. Am I saying this correctly? They're literally having a vast experience, perhaps in a very compressed time, as we're measuring time outside of their near-death experience, but inside their experience, they're having this very extended experience. This is actually very confusing when you start talking about it, because they say that there is no sense of time in the near-death experience. They say it's as if you were living in eternity, everything was happening at once, and yet when they tell you what happened in the NDE, they tell it as if it's a sequence of events. First, this happened, and then this happened. I say to them, wait a minute, you're saying that there's a sequence of events, and yet there was no time. How can that be? And the answer they say is that it doesn't make sense here on this earth plane. It made perfect sense over there. But here, it's a paradox that I can't explain. They say that this is one of these things that can't be put into words. You experience it over there, and you can't make sense of it over here. As you start to talk like this, I'm sure they're going to be you are a skeptic as well, but they're going to be skeptics that are listening and they're going to be thinking, well, Bruce is going down a particular, at this point in his life, is going down a particular religious direction. I don't feel that personally because when I hear the stories, I'm like, okay, this is a man who's gathering data. And he started gathering data at a young age. And there's a lot of this data. And we don't have an explanation for this data. And you're not attempting to give me a theory for this data. You're just saying, this is really interesting. And I agree. Right. I don't have any type of spiritual or religious belief to form a framework for this. I'm just kind of puzzled by it. I don't think that the materialist explanations we have really explain anything, but I don't have a better one. I just see that this is what the data show. We need to try to understand it. And the fact that we haven't understood it yet makes me think we're not asking the right questions. Do we have a good measure of consciousness? No, we don't. We have good measures of the brain when we appear to be doing conscious things. And we can understand that, for example, the cerebral cortex and coordination among different parts of the cortex are involved in higher consciousness. But these are correlates, not causes. The near-death experience and other experiences like that suggest that the brain is not causing this, but is sort of facilitating it. Let me give you one more piece line of evidence that's developed in the last decade. We've been doing neuroimaging of people having elaborate psychedelic drug trips. And this has only been possible with advanced neuroimaging techniques we've developed in recent years. And studies done at Johns Hopkins in the US and at Imperial College in London have consistently shown that when people have more elaborate mystical experiences during psychedelic drug trips, 
they are associated with a decrease in brain activity. We assumed that these drugs work by stimulating the brain to hallucinate. And what we find is the exact opposite. It tends to shut down the brain to make it quieter. And then you have the more elaborate experiences. So again, there's evidence that the brain is not causing consciousness. In fact, in some ways, it may be interfering with consciousness. Let me throw something out that you may or may not be aware of. As I told you, I'm currently in Vietnam. I did not know this before I came here, but Vietnamese are, to use a word, are very conscious of the idea of ghosts. This is very common in culture here that people are concerned about ghosts or relatives are considered. It's almost like in some ways, perhaps they, as a culture, are aware of some of the research that you're talking about. I don't know how that information has been dispersed in the culture, but it's almost like in a way, the entire culture understands the idea of near-death experiences and there's some reverence for it, perhaps. When I talk to groups in the West, in the United States and in in Europe, I usually have to explain what near-death experiences are, bring people along gradually because they're not familiar with these concepts. But a while back, I had a chance to go to Dharamsala, Dalai Lama's invitation to have a conference with the Buddhist monks there. And when I started to explain the near-death experience research to them, they all knew all about it. Their questions were not, how can this be? But let me tell you about my experience. They all were very familiar with them. Now, I will say that how people interpret these is based on their cultural background. For example, many people in a near-death experience will talk about encountering a warm, loving being of light that makes them feel welcomed and peaceful and like everything's fine. In Western countries, people are likely to say this was God, and they don't use that terminology in other cultures, in Buddhist and in Hindu cultures. But even here, people who say, I met God, will quickly say, I'm not talking about the God that I learned about in church. This is much bigger than that. I just use the word God so you'll know what I'm talking about, because I don't know what else to use. And many will qualify it in saying, well, it could be God, it could be Krishna, it could be Buddha, who knows what it was, but it was something that made me feel safe and loved and welcome. How they interpret the NDE and things that happen in it is based on what metaphors they have available to them to describe basically an undescribable experience. I mean, if we are talking about things that we don't even have the science remotely figured out about, we're just taking terms and words that we've got and trying to apply the best that we got to something that's completely unexplained, to think that our words that we currently have access to and our understanding that we currently have, that somehow or another that's going to all match up and we're going to call it correctly, that's kind of wishful thinking, right? Exactly, yeah. I'm fairly convinced, although I'm positive from all this evidence, that death is not the end of our consciousness. If The mind can function when the brain is not doing very well. Is it plausible that the mind can function after the brain dies? Well, the evidence from some of these near-death experiences suggests that, yes, it can. It continues. What form that takes is a complete mystery to me. People describe what happened in this other realm, but they're describing it metaphorically. And I don't take any of it as literal descriptions. I'm prepared to be very surprised if I do find myself surviving. One thing they do consistently say is that, However you describe this afterlife, whatever it is, it's not something to be feared. It's not something that you should be afraid of or dreading. It's pure science fiction in my mind when I start to think about it. It's like, okay, if the body and the brain are ultimately not important after death, because you're giving examples of people outside of the body, the mind, the consciousness is somewhere else in some other realm, perhaps. I think what's interesting when you put some of these examples on the table, and again, people are going to have to go check out the book, the new book after, but when you put some of these examples on the table, again, I'm sure you've got thousands and thousands of these examples, and you you mentioned talking with the monks and whatnot. There's just so much we don't understand, which is just fun and fascinating all at once. We are just in our infancy of studying the brain. We don't have any idea how to study the mind. People have been trying to do this. I mean, for 50 years, Charlie Tart has been trying to develop a technology for first-person science of the mind. It's very difficult to even find words to talk about these things. So I think we're a long way from understanding what's going on here with the brain-mind interaction. 
Yeah, this is one of those slack jaw conversations for me where I'm kind of like, you just don't know what to say in some points. This guy, Robin Hansen, I had on the show. I loved his idea, though, that if we can get to the point, because I think it dovetails into where your world goes also, if we can get to the point where the mind can be ported, I guess we've solved everything at that point in time in some ways. If we can actually find out where the mind is, if the mind could ever be on a drive, so to speak, or then we will all find out one day that the mind is already on a drive, and that's the answer to what you're figuring out. Exactly, exactly. If you think of us as animals that evolved in the natural world, which we certainly are, at least in part, it's a mystery of even why we have consciousness. We've developed all sorts of computers that can perceive things and respond to things, and yet, as far as we can tell, they're not aware of that. They're not conscious of what they're doing. Why couldn't animals like humans have evolved without consciousness, just perceiving things and then automatically responding to them? We would be able to survive and reproduce quite well in the world without being aware of what we're doing, without having consciousness. So where does consciousness come from and why would we even have it? We have no idea. I'm prone to check out YouTube videos that show evolution. Essentially, the fish crawls out of the ocean, becomes a rodent becomes a monkey, becomes us. That kind of also dovetails into what you just said. Okay, where does the consciousness part fit in? Where does the mind part start? Because there's all these other animals that were out there kind of chilling out, doing their own thing. I don't know what's going on inside their mind. Maybe they have some kind of consciousness and they just can't talk. Who knows, right? We don't know. Now we've been able to communicate with apes, with dolphins. We know there is some form of consciousness in some of those animals as well. But how far down the evolutionary ladder does it go? Do insects have consciousness as we do? Do amoebas have consciousness? Do trees and grass have consciousness? We can't imagine what that would be. Let me keep you at the critics part for one more second as we wind down. I asked earlier, but what do some of the critics that really perhaps go after you. You seem like a nice guy though. So I don't know how hard they're going after you. They don't have an answer too. So I mean, I don't know how they can really criticize. I mean, they just tell you to be quiet. Stop talking about that. Don't look, don't be curious guy. Well, I have heard that. (laughs) I've had uh, chairman tell me, stop doing this work. You're embarrassing us. Study things that can be put in a test tube and measured. Interesting. I've made it my point for my entire career to publish this research in only the, the prestigious medical journals that go through peer review and therefore get respected when they're published. And that gives me some credibility. But I understand the skepticism because I don't want to believe this myself. And yet it's not honest to deny it. It's really happening. The bottom line of that many skeptics come to is they just don't believe it, period. They think you're making it up, you're being gullible, and it didn't really happen. And as a psychiatrist, I see the profound impact these experiences have on people's lives. I can't deny that this is really happening to them. Maybe something is happening. Let me pull on that string a little bit without you naming names. So you do have people in the academic community that will basically say, hey, Bruce, why don't you slow this one down? Let's walk this back a little bit. They don't want you to pull on that string. Of course. Academicians and doctors are just like everybody else. Some think that this is the most fascinating research in the world, and some think it's a total waste of time and resources. And you just have to confront them and deal with the legitimate criticisms and dismiss those that aren't legitimate. Even if all of the near-death stuff... Even if it was all just coincidence or whatever, if we took it all the way back to your other part, which is consciousness right now while we're alive, we can't explain that either, then you have done a service, in my opinion, at least for me, you're reminding me, hey, Mike, whether we're dead or alive, we can't explain consciousness at all. Right. Which may mean that we're just not asking the right questions. If we can't find an answer to the question, maybe we need to say it a different way. Talking about the critics... I will say that there's been a tremendous change in attitude in the half century that I've been doing this research. When we first started presenting this material in medical conferences back around 1980, there'd be a polite silence from the audience. People would wonder whether people are just making this up. Did it really happen? Now, it's so common. You see this in television shows and movies, even in comic strips have near-death experiences in them. Everybody knows about them. And when we talk about near-death experiences in a medical conference now, quite often, a doctor in the audience will stand up and say, let me tell you about my experience. Doctors are very aware that these experiences have consequences in their patients' lives, and therefore, they want to know about them. No matter what they think causes the NDE, 
they realize these are important things in their patients' lives, and therefore they want to know everything they can about them. Fascinating world, fascinating topic. The book, After a Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond. For my own curiosity, I could probably just let you tell me as many of these stories as possible. (laughs) I mean, if it's some kind of a hoax, it's very clever and put together very well. When you lay some of these stories out, I mean, and again, I'm just extrapolating out. I'm sure the examples go on forever. And I'm sure you've probably tried to poke as many holes in things as possible. That's your nature. You're like, I don't want to believe any, I don't want to believe any of this stuff. This is kind of crazy. I'm not buying it. Yeah. I still do try to poke holes in it. But I'll tell you, again, as a psychiatrist, what I find most persuasive are the impact of these experiences on people's lives. People don't turn their lives around because of a strange dream or hallucination. Yet time after time, near-death experiences change their careers, change relationships. I'll give you some examples of this. Steve Price was a career Marine. He had been a high school bully, kind of a macho guy. All his life, he wanted to be a Marine. He ended up going to Vietnam, and he was leading his platoon into battle. He was a sergeant, and he was shot in the chest, and had shrapnel throughout his lungs. He was evacuated to a military hospital in the Philippines, and during surgery, he had a near-death experience. When he came back, when he woke from that experience, he was totally transformed. He could not stand the idea of violence. He tried to go back to Vietnam, but he was sent back there, tried to lead his platoon, and found he could not shoot his rifle. The idea of killing somebody else was just unthinkable to him. So he ended up having to leave the Marines, came back to the States, and ended up trained to be a medical technician. Another fellow, Joe Girasi, was a police officer who had a near-death experience when he bled out during surgery. And he also came back thinking that he just could not tolerate violence, and he had to leave the police force and ended up becoming a teacher. And I've had example after example of people who had to change careers. They were in cutthroat businesses where they decided that competition no longer made sense. We're all part of this when you go into a collaborative field. And they end up going into some helping profession, healthcare, social work, teaching, clergy, so forth. Those couple examples right there, though, skeptics could say, well, okay, you know, if I'm in a war and I got shot up and I don't die, one could reasonably say that's a kind of a natural reaction to leave, not want to be involved in that world anymore. I can give you many more examples of people who were <laughs> not in that, in that situation, who changed their lives around because of the near-death experience. This is about patterns. Yes, you judging accuracy. So you are a scientist. You've gone down the path of assembling and measuring and judging. And this is statistical work. This is not some just, you're giving me a few one-off examples in a one-hour conversation. This is extremely detailed, well-researched, going on for very wide data sets. Right. I don't take any one experience as evidence because we may be misinterpreting things, we may be uh, misremembering things. There may be some data we don't know about this particular experience that explains it away. What we look for are consistent patterns among hundreds of experiences and find the things that are consistent among NDEs, not the things that are unique to each any particular one. Very cool stuff. Bruce, again, the book, After a Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond, we have just only touched on issues. I think a lot of people probably enjoy your work, enjoy your book. Many books out there. I've not seen all of them, but many books in your career. Best of luck over at UVA. I've not been there for a long time. I guess I'm trying to think last time I was at UVA. 2005, 2006. How long have you been there? This time since 1995. I was here in the 70s for about six years. Gotcha, gotcha. What's changed about Charlottesville? Anything? Oh, gosh. It's become much more cosmopolitan. It's much bigger than it was back in the 70s. Well, cool stuff. Hey, where can we direct people? Where would you like to send them to beyond Amazon to pick up the book and all that kind of fun stuff? They can check you out at the University of Virginia's website. Any other website you want to direct people to? Yes, I have a website, www.brucegrayson.com, and that's Grayson with an E, B-R-U-C-E-G-R-E-Y-S-O-N.com. There are a lot of resources there and links from there to other resources as well. Bruce, thank you for coming on. Well, thank you, Michael, for inviting me. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, 
protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.